I am honored to introduce our keynote speaker, Imam Faisal Rauf. Thank you, Daryl, for that nice introduction. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad, Sayyid al-Mursaleen wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. My dear brothers and sisters, it is customary for us as Muslims to always begin by invoking the name of our Creator, the One, the Only, the Absolute, the Creator of the heavens and the earth and all that is between them. <coughs> And to remember that as creatures of God, we have been created for a purpose that is most important. The theme that was selected for my presentation this evening has to do with Abraham. In part because we just celebrated the Eid al-Adha, a celebration, a festival that reenacts much of the experiences of Abraham in a place that was founded by Abraham around a house, the Kaaba, that was established by Abraham. But there's also another reason. I just turned 65 a few days ago. And Abraham's most important work began when he was an old man. <laughs> As many of you know in the stories of both the Bible and the Quran, you know, when the angels approached him and Sarah and uh, said that he would be having a son, she says, you know, she laughed and said, who, me, a barren, a, you know, woman who's always past the age of child rearing and my old, you know, you know, uh, I, I'm trying to find what the right adjective to use that would be appropriate. And he said, yes, indeed. And she laughed, but that is indeed what happened. And the story began of the phase, perhaps the most important phase of Abraham's life. And I'm hopeful that this will be the, also the most important phase of my life and many of us who are of my generation. Abraham is a very important figure in our faith because unlike what many Muslims believe, our faith was not begun by Muhammad. Many Muslims have myths. We have many myths. One of the myths is that our faith was established by Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. It is more correct to say that our faith was started by Abraham and that Muhammad was the reviver of the Abrahamic faith tradition. In fact, in our five time daily prayers, we say, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad kama salli ala Sayyidina Ibrahim. O oh, oh Lord, may you bestow your salawat, a very special term whose meanings are hard to translate, but who includes the idea of blessings and grace and a special connection <coughs> upon our master Muhammad as you have bestowed them upon our master Abraham. Barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad kama barakta ala Sayyidina Ibrahim. And may you bless our master Muhammad as you used to bless our master Abraham. So we mention Sayyidina Ibrahim in every one of our five time daily prayers. We express, we, 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 we mention him as the avataric founder of our faith. That we invoke Allah's blessings on Muhammad as he, as he bestowed them upon Abraham and upon Ali Ibrahim. And who is Ali Ibrahim? The word Al is generally translated to mean the family of or the house of. Like you say, Ali Saud today, the house of Saud. And the house of Saud includes like, you know, I don't know how many, 9,000 princes and the whole family and their descendants. So the Ali Ibrahim includes who? Not only the house of Abraham, but his children and his descendants. And who are his descendants? Who are included among his descendants? Not only Ismail and Ishaq, not only Ishaq, Ishaq's children, Ishaq had Yaqub, Jacob, who was later renamed Israel, and the children of Yaqub, the children of Israel. So when you do salawat, Allahumma salli Sayyidina Muhammad, kama salat ala Ali Ibrahim, 
you are actually invoking Allah's salawats upon all the children of Israel as well. So structurally, we are invoking salawat upon the Jewish community, upon the Christian community, as well as upon the Muslim community. What greater expression of interfaith respect, interfaith affection, interfaith relationship embraced within a sense of a family of the Abrahamic faith tradition and the very structure that we are praying upon our Jewish and Christian brothers and sisters, even while certain imams at the end of that may be cursing those communities which many of us have heard in some of our mosques. But it's important for us to remind ourselves of these fundamental principles which are structurally, structurally embedded in our faith because these are actually what our faith teach us. One of the things that I learned as I studied the Quran and studied my faith is how many things that I was taught to believe were not were actually disproven by the very statements in the Quran. And many things that developed later, which I thought were fundamental to the faith, are really cultural developments which developed later. Either they're cultural or they are jurisprudential or opinions of some, th of some scholars, but not truly fundamental to our faith. Even our name as Muslims, although Abraham was the one who was the f among those who said, I'm the first to submit, and I wouldn't Muslimin. And the name Islam was given to us through that verse. But Allah never calls us by that name in the Quran. Allah always addresses the followers of the Prophet of the believers. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. Qul lil mu'minina. Allah tells the Prophet, command the believers, command the believing women to do such and such. Never once does Allah address them by, oh you Muslims. And in fact, after the death of the Prophet, the first title that the caliphs gave themselves was Amir al-Mu'mineen, commander of the believers, not commander of the Muslims, not Amir al-Muslimin. So one of the questions that I've always asked Muslim scholars as a growing young man is, when did we start calling ourselves Muslims? But the more important issue is, can we recalibrate ourselves? Can we think of ourselves as mu'minun? If you were to think of yourself as a believer first and not as a Muslim, and get away a little bit. By getting away, I don't mean getting away completely, but by really recalibrating what it means to be mu'min, to be a believer and to be a Muslim in the language of the Quran. Because part of our objective as believers, part of the objective of following the sunnah of Muhammad is to be, as I was sharing with my brother Dr. Abu Bakr as we were driving, is to always have the freshness of revelation on our tongues. One of the things that we can only imagine about is what it would have been like to be a companion of the Prophet. To be a companion of the Prophet, one of the things that you would have experienced is the freshness of revelation. That every part that was revealed of the Quran would be revealed in a context. It was not something that you read in a book that was given to you by your ancestors like we are, like we experience it. It is something that is given to you freshly and has an immediacy and a relevance that is so, that, that that cannot be really embraced when it is something which is a thousand years old. But part of our task is to imagine that, and part of our task is to recreate the freshness of the connection between us and our Creator that enables us to engage not only the Quran with the Sunnah of the Prophet in a way that gives us this sense of freshness. And this sense of freshness can only be obtained when you have a spiritual connection to God. Because without that spiritual connection, our religion, our practice of religion, is an empty shell. 
I write about it in my book and I've spoken about it when I was a young boy and I was taught how to pray. And every time I was saying, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, a voice in my heart would say, Faisal, you are a hypocrite. You're making a statement that is hugely significant, that you're bearing witness to God, but you haven't borne witness to God. You're no better than a parrot. And this tension within me is what drove me, what, what drove me to, to, to search for the experience of God. Because without that experience, I felt I was just like a parrot. What does prayer mean? What does worship mean? What does being a practitioner of a faith tradition means if it is not connected to that direct connection to the Creator? To make a long story short, this is what prompted me on the Sufi path, on the path of, of dhikr, of remembrance of God, because that to me was the only way. And till today, I don't think there is any other way by which you can get a direct connection with God and in a sustained way. You can have a serendipitous relationship with the Creator, but you cannot have a sustained relationship with the Creator within a faith context, within a religious context, even if it's not anchored in a fundamental dimension of spirituality. To us as Muslims, you're all familiar with the concept of the importance of adhering to the Sunnah of Muhammad. We follow the precedence of Muhammad. And this is also emphasized to us in the Quran by the verse in which Allah says, لَقَدَ كَنَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ In the Messenger of God, there is an excellent example for you, Uswatun Hasana, an exemplar for you, to whoever desires God and the last day and remembers Allah frequently. This word Uswa, which, is, which, which can be argued to be the basis of us following the Sunnah of Muhammad, is only used for one other person in the Quran. Sorry, the thing that we're supposed to ask everybody I'm not doing it. Unfortunately, it's my mother who's calling me, so I'll have to... Uh... Thank you. Yeah, I suppose I should, right? Um, so as I was saying, the only other individual in the Quran for whom the word uswa is used is Sayyidina Ibrahim. And... I've switched it off already. Allah says, قَدَ كَانَتْ لَكُمْ Uswatun Hasana fi Ibrahim wa ma'ahu. Indeed, there is an excellent, there is an example for you, an exemplar for you in Abraham and those who were with him. So again, we see another link with Sayyidina Ibrahim. That Sayyidina Ibrahim is also an exemplar for us. And how is he an example? He's an example in the very longing he had for God, in the journey in his own spiritual journey and discovery of God, which the Qur'an describes. You know, Pre-people who didn't have a revealed tradition would very often worship mountains, they would worship the star, the sun, the moon. And in the story of Abraham given in the Qur'an, it talks about his search and how he looked at the star, well, maybe this the star is my God. When it's set, it says, you know, I can't worship something that sets. Maybe the moon is my God. The moon waned and he didn't accept that either. The same thing with the sun. So you can see how he was exploring the traditions of his own environment, the tradition of his own family, the tradition of his own society, in worshipping objects which people used to worship. He says, no, 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 I will submit myself only to the Creator. We too, men, most of us too, at some part of our journey of our lives, we also look for God. We search for God. We, we examine the faith of our fathers or our mothers and question them. But we have to also question them with the relevance. I mean, when the Quran criticizes the, the contemporaries of the Prophet who refuse to accept the Quran, and they would say, well, we are following the practices of our parents, the religion of our fathers. Well, when I read that verse, I says, well, 
am I guilty of the same verse? I'm practicing the religion of my fathers without kicking the tires and making sure it's really a religion that works for me. So in a certain sense, we can apply the, the teachings of Abraham or the, the, the journey of Abraham to our own particular lives. And this is another important way in which we also apply the, we can say, you can, that, that Ibrahim is, a, is relevant to us and is an uswa, an example for us in helping us uh, embrace and assimilate and integrate our own faith tradition. So much for you might, what you might say the, the spiritual or the religious aspect of Abraham as an example for us. I'd like now to shift to the idea of what Abraham did and accomplished as a prophet in terms of what he established. No one was asked to sacrifice probably more than Abraham. After having a son at an old age, and you know when you have a son at an old age, you really appreciate the child. <laughs> you know, when you're young and you have children, it's, you appreciate them. But when you finally, at the age of 50, 60, 70, you finally father a, a, a child, especially when you didn't have any, well, that child becomes very, very precious and very dear. And yet, right after the birth of Ismail, his first son, what was Abraham commanded to do as a result of some domestic difficulties? He was asked to deposit them in an empty place now known as Mecca. And Hagar and their son Ismail, he had to leave them there. Not an easy decision for any father to do. And when Hagar asked him when he was leaving them, did Allah instruct you to do that? And he said, yes. And she said, in that case, Allah will not abandon us. Out of that, a well of Zamzam was discovered and Abraham used to come to visit them from time to time. And when Ismail grew up at a certain stage when he was a lad, he was commanded to sacrifice him according to our tradition. I know the, the Bible, the Jews and Christians believe it was Ishaq, but we believe it was Ismail in our tradition who was the one whom Abraham was commanded to sacrifice. This came to Abraham in a dream. And the first time he got the dream, he didn't think, you know, he doubted it. The second time in the dream, it was now 50-50. The third time he had the dream, he knew it was an instruction from the divine, and he had to do it. And the wonderful thing in reading the passage in the Quran is that when Ismail learned that he was to be sacrificed, what did he tell his father? He says, Abati if ma tu'mar. O my father, O dad, execute or implement what you have been commanded to do. Satajuni insha'Allah min as you'll find me, God willing, among those who are patient. Now, what does it take emotionally for both a father and a son to submit and to be willing to sacrifice themselves at such a high level and high degree of sacrifice? So the theme of sacrifice is a very key one, another important theme in Abraham's story. And then when Ismail grew up and became a man, Abraham and Ismail together built the Kaaba. According to the Quran, awwal baytin, the first house that was established for people for the worship of the one God. So Abraham established a house, established, he was the founder of the city of Mecca, and he was commanded to establish a community of believers. And he did this by commanding his children to make sure that they believed in the one God. And when you read the story, even in the Quran, when Abraham instructed his sons, Isaac instructed his sons, Jacob, as he was on his deathbed, instructing his sons, who will you worship after me? What do we say in the Quran? We worship the Lord, your Lord, and the Lord of your father and your father's father, Abraham, the one God.
The other thing that Abraham built was the Kaaba. The Kaaba, the first, we call it a mosque, but unlike any other mosque or any other temple or any other synagogue or church established for the worship of God, this particular structure is not defined by anything that happens inside of it. In fact, nothing goes on inside the Kaaba. The Kaaba is just an empty box. But what it defines is our direction of prayer. And everything that, is, that defines our religion happens outside of the Kaaba. The five-time daily prayers all happens outside of the Kaaba, not inside of it. The tawaf happens outside the Kaaba. The rituals of Hajj and Umrah, the Sa'i, happen outside the Kaaba. Even those who teach, you'll find people sitting on chairs, you know, having little religious lessons, all sit outside the Kaaba. And when three years ago I tried to establish the Cordoba house and didn't succeed, and as I was preparing my thoughts for this lecture, I came to the realization that, you know what, maybe what, what God wants us to do is build a community that reflects or reenacts in a number of key ways the story of Abraham. A community established upon faith. A community that has integrated and assimilated the fact that in our five-time daily prayer, we pray for the Jews and the Christians, Ali Ibrahim. The Jews define themselves by a bloodline, by a family, Ali Ibrahim in a very specific way, as, as well as in the Christians and upon ourselves. A community that defines itself, not by what happens inside the Cordoba house, but by, but, by, but by what happens outside of it. So perhaps in the story of Abraham, there is a lot for us to learn and to assimilate and to apply and to integrate. And yet there is structure, there is ritual, there is performance, there is meaning. I was happy to see here this evening my friend Lela Laskari, probably the person I've known longest in this country. When I came in this country in 1965, I was 17. She must have been a young girl of what, four or six or something, studying in the Sunday school at the Islamic Center. Her father and my late father were dear, very dear friends, as we are with the whole family. <coughs> And she was telling me how they, she started the Friday prayers at NYU. And they had to struggle to get three or four people. And now they have a community of 7,000 apparently on the campus of NYU. You never know what's going to happen. Similarly, when Abraham was invited to call the Hajj, invite people to come to the Hajj, he didn't know how many people would come to the Hajj. Allah says, they will come. Just call. They will come on every on every riding vehicle. They could not have imagined planes at that time. But now we go to Hajj on all kinds, on all manner of, uh, of uh, means of transportation, seeking and devoting ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the reason why you've been invited here and selected here is for us to think about this. Think about what our work here as American Muslims. We come from various parts of the world, some from this country, some immigrants, some children of immigrants. We come from all parts of the world. And in one respect, the American Muslim community resembles the community that performs Hajj and Umrah every year in that it is from all over the world with the difference that the community that goes to Hajj or Umrah is a transient one, whereas here we are a permanent one. When you go to Umrah or Hajj, you'll see Muslims from all parts of the world, all countries, all nations, all madhabs, all schools of jurisprudence, all there for the purpose of worshiping God. But they're there for a few days, a week, two weeks, maybe three at the very most. 
But we who are here, the American Muslim community, and certainly the American Muslim community in the New York, greater, the greater New York area, is a cross-section of Muslims from all over the world. We have Muslims of all ethnicities, all cultures, all madahibs, all schools of thought. And the task before us as we build an American Muslim community that is as defined by an authentic definition of what it means to be American and equally by an authentic definition of what it means to be Muslim is part of our assignment moving forward. And therefore our purpose and our work is not only to carry and maintain our cultural heritage, but also to meet the challenge which every generation of Muslims and every generation of every faith tradition has to meet and ask itself and answer. Namely, what are the core aspects of our faith? What are the fundamentals of our religion? The things that are timeless and eternal. And how do we express it in a continuously changing present? As I mentioned to many, many uh, uh, spaces before, this is part of our own tradition. When Islam went from the Hejaz to Egypt, to Senegal, to North Africa, to Byzantium, which is modern Turkey, to Persia, which is modern Iran, to India, South Asia, which is today India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, etc., to Southeast Asia, Malaysia, and Indonesia. It expressed itself in those cultures. In their, it, it even adopted their pre-Islamic legal structures in many cases. It, it expressed itself in their, in their particular architecture, in their particular musical forms. And therefore, we too have to express Islam in American forms, in American law. Qawwali music has a very Indian sound to it. It's Muslim, but it's Indian. The architecture of Sinan in Turkey is uniquely Byzantine. Even the dome, you know, many Muslims think that the dome is something that we created. We stole it from the Christians. Okay? The church of Hagia Sophia was begun in 530, 40 years before the birth of the Prophet. We adopted the dome. We adopted the church spires and now minarets. And we think this is uniquely Islamic. The Prophet's mosque never had a dome, never had a... And what you see today in Medina is not the way it looked like the time of the Prophet. The Prophet's mosque was built with uh, palm leaves for a roof. When it rained, it would leak. He didn't have a beautiful mimbar, a beautiful uh, you know, uh, thing to go on to give his sermons. He performed his sermon on a, on a log of wood. And they, and they prayed on the dirt floor. So those of you who want to really follow the sunnah of the Prophet in every respect, <laughs> that's what you should do. But this is what is an example of what I mean by people having myths about our faith. This is a sunnah, but it's not a sunnah tashri'iyya, as the scholars have said. Our scholars have differentiated between a sunnah which has a shara'i value, which has a legal imperative, and sunnah gharat tashri'iyya, which is not a very easy concept for many people to grasp, because it includes even aspects of worship. The Prophet only did hajj once. Does this mean if you perform your hajj more than once, you are violating the sunnah of the Prophet and performing a bid'ah? Technically, yes. You're not following the sunnah of the Prophet. But it's not wrong to perform hajj more than once. So the concept of where the line and where the boundary of sunnah shara'iyya and sunnah ghayta shara'iyya is something which requires a, a little bit of a nuanced understanding of Islamic law. It's not just dealing with the fact that his mosque was built one way or he did his sermon on a log of wood and not on a beautiful, beautiful uh, pulpit. But part, this is what we have to learn because Muslims have many myths. Among our myths is that you must wear a hijab. If you don't wear a hijab, you're not a really good Muslim. 
Or if you don't wear a beard, you're not really a good Muslim. Or that, you know, the, the, the man is the one who has to propose in a wedding, not the woman. Well, Khadija was the one who proposed to, to Muhammad. So there are things that are not really part of our, part of the Islamic required jurisprudence, but are culturally required, which Islamic law accepted. Because the ada, the custom of a people, or the pre-Islamic law of a people, when it is not contradictory to the, to the Quran and the Sunnah, is considered acceptable. And this is how things which were cultural were deemed to be religious by many people. So part of our work moving forward as Muslims in America is to understand the core of our faith, understand with great adequate detail and express what it means to be American Muslims in the future. This is part of the work which you have been invited here to begin and think about how to do. So we're not here to ask you to help build a particular project like the Cordoba House project. Although we have a Cordoba House project, our first one, which is going to be established in a place called the Chautauqua Institution in upstate New York, which all of you are invited to attend next year when we go. It's a place where they have a nine-week summer program. And even that Cordoba House is also defined not by what happens inside the bricks and mortar, by, by, but by what happens outside in the Chautauqua community where we engage in the process of not only defining who we are as American Muslims, but also engage with the broader community to, 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 to build a sense of who we are as American Muslims, but American Muslims who are engaged in the broader society and who are interlocutors between the broader community, the country that we are living in, and our own faith community, both in the United States and internationally. So I hope I've shaped for you here the pattern. The project is not specific in terms of bricks and mortar, not specific in terms of specific dollars and cents that you're being asked to do today. But what I'm calling upon you today is to build the project of the American Muslim community, defined along the ways in the pattern of how Sayyidina Ibrahim established a community, defined not only by, in terms of your own descendants, by the al of the people who are here in the United States, but also defined by those who, are, who, who will join the faith as an, as, a, as an aspect of their fundamental faith and creed and belief. This is not my project, this is your project. It's our project. It's a project for your children and your grandchildren who will be living in this country. It is a project for them and for the world because what happens in America today impacts the whole world. This is what I'm inviting you to. This is what you've been invited to think about, to work on. You are the ones who will be deciding what projects to, do, to, to select. This is going to be something where the collective wisdom of this group of people and how they choose to move forward will define the future. It will define a sense of who you are, but it must be built and anchored on these fundamental three aspects which Abraham established. A fundamental sense of monotheism, a fundamental belief and faith in the one God, a, a, a deep spirituality and connectedness to God and frequency of remembering Him. The second pillar on which this is to be built is on a, on a set of ethics and morality that reflects the morality of the Qur'an and the practice of the Prophets. And thirdly, upon the Abrahamic element of, or, or example of sacrifice. The demand is for us to have faith, to live in accordance with this, the principles, the moral imperative of that faith, and to sacrifice for that. And in that, we shall be find not only our own Islamicity or Islamicness, but also our own humanity in a way that not only unites us with the Creator, unites us with the prophets and messengers, but unites us with all of humanity, inshallah. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.